welcome. It's an honor to be here today to talk about your lung microbiome, what is it, and how it may benefit or harm you during the COVID-19 pandemic. Briefly, my background is I'm an infectious disease specialist, board certified in infectious diseases and internal medicine. Also, over the last decade or so, I've accumulated about 90 hours in functional nutrition, which has helped me learn how to nourish your microbiome. And today, I would like to track the data that will lead to the conclusions that we'll come to at the end of this talk. I have no potential conflicts of interest relevant to this presentation, and the slides I'm presenting will be my own, and those modified and referenced from various experts in this area, and I've tried my best to re reference every slide uh, appropriately. I should add that this is for educational purposes only, and it's not designed to, to diagnose or treat any uh, ailment, but I always encourage you to work with your qualified health care provider in making any changes to your medication, diet, or overall health care plan. Well, the topics we're going to be reviewing include what is the lung microbiome? How can the lung microbiome be beneficial or harmful? how the lung microbiome may determine the outcome of COVID-19, and what can be done to restore a healthy, balanced, diverse lung microbiome, a type of a shield, if you will, if we accept the fact that the lung microbiome is very important in determining outcome with COVID-19. Well, let's just go to PubMed and just see the literature behind this subject. The lung microbiome, as you can see, if we go back a couple decades ago, barely any, and then it really began to take off around the year 2011. And thus far this year, as of the 12th of April, there's been 162 publications. So this pales in comparison to the literature on the gut microbiome. If you go to the PubMed and put in gut microbiome, so far this year, there's been over 1,600 published articles, and last year, there were around 5,800 articles on the gut microbiome. But nevertheless, the lung microbiome is emerging as a very important uh, endeavor in our scientific world. And as we'll be discussing, it's intimately linked with your gut microbiome. Well, this is in the context of a very unprecedented, unpredictable time with a lot of unknowns centered around the, the, the disease that we recognize as COVID-19. And this is the dashboard you can pull up at any point 24-7. Uh, here I pulled it up on the 18th of, of April, showing you the total worldwide cases, the total deaths associated with this uh, pandemic, total U.S. deaths down here with the total uh, U.S. numbers there. And in Nebraska at this point, we had over 1,100 total cases and 24 deaths. Well, let's look at some of the basic terminology. Microbiota, all the microorganisms in a specific environment, which includes bacteria, so-called archaea, how many of you have you heard of archaea? <laughs> archaea is a third kingdom of life, as it turns out, that there's three main kingdoms of life. We're eukaryotes. We have cells with nuclei. Then there's a second kingdom called prokaryotes that are bacteria that do not have nuclei. And then it turns out the third kingdom, which if you're in the creativity, may have been the first microorganism created called archaea. And indeed, uh, we have archaea within our intestinal tract as a part of our microbiome. We also have fungi. Sometimes, or some studies have suggested an average of about 60 different fungi within our intestinal tract. 
although pales to the potential of 10,000 different species of bacteria, protists or protozoa, and then finally this entity that isn't really defined as life, if you will, but a biochemical structure in between a cell biochemical structure, virus, virus, which we'll, we're going to be coming back and discussing more. But it's been estimated we have maybe one quadrillion viruses within our intestinal tract. And we're just beginning to discover what those viruses are doing, called the virome. We're going to focus on bacteria today. And bacteria can interact with us in a commensal fashion, where one will get benefit versus a symbiotic relationship where both can benefit or as we have focused on many times in infectious disease over the decades, a so-called pathobiont or a, a pathogenic relationship wh where one is harmed. So microbiome is defined as then all these microorganisms in an environment and their genetic material. And again, we're going to focus on bacteria today. I think it's important to understand the concept of ecosystem. And, and perhaps back to my undergraduate years, this is when I really began to get interested in microorganisms in the field, what was called limnology. Limnology, which is the study of freshwater lakes and streams. We would go out and sample lakes like out at Lake McConaughey and spend the day sampling various layers of the ecosystem of the lake. And then we'd go in at night to our room together with microscopes, maybe a little mood adjustment, if you will, uh, and then study the different layers of those ecosystems. Of the, and it was fascinating to see all these microorganisms swarming around. And, different layers and what we learn then that ecosystems occur living organisms in a physical environment and thus fast forwarding now to what we now understand that our whole body is filled with various ecosystems specific microbial profiles have been defined and associated with numerous areas of our body, malpharynx, the respiratory tract, skin, and so on. And so the difference, for example, from the mouth to the gastrointestinal tract can be a distance like from the Great Plains in Nebraska to a tropical jungle when you get into the colon. Regional growth conditions becomes an important concept as we now begin to focus on the microbiome initially in the gut and then the lung that just changes in one of these factors can sometimes have a profound effect on the microorganisms within that environment, including those listed on this slide, pH, temperature, oxygen, tension, nutrient availability, and so on. The next term that we need to define before we go on is perturbation, perturbation which is a disturbance in an ecosystem. And this, today we're kind of focusing on microbial ecosystems. But every ecosystem is very dynamic. And a stable ecosystem, which can equate to health, has two properties. Resistance, the ability to resist change triggered by a disturbance. And resilience, the ability of an ecosystem to absorb disturbance and still, still retain its basic functions and structure. As you can see here with various perturbances, the so-called resistance kind of holds up until a point where you have lost your ability or have, have lost resistance. And resilience here where you get hit with a perturbance down and up and down and potentially up. And I like this slide because when I'm encountering patients in critical care, especially with multiple comorbidities and complications, it's so sad. I look at that patient. They have lost resilience. They have lost resistance. They're not capable of bouncing back frequently. And they get in this so-called perfect storm 
Finally, a concept of dysbiosis. Dysbiosis referring to a microbial imbalance on or inside the body. Most commonly reported as a condition in the digestive tract or an imbalance in gut bacteria. So you'll see the terms dysbiotic gut microbiome. But as we're going to be coming back and discussing, you can have a dysbiotic lung microbiome. Frequently, this is referred to as changes in composition. Who is there? The abundance, how much is there of a given organism? And then finally, the distribution, where organisms should be but have redistributed into a space where they're causing problems. Four types have been defined in some definitions, including the loss of a keystone taxa. In other words, there's some real key bacteria we're learning more and more about that form these guilds and then really have much more of a profound effect on basic metabolic functions, which we'll come back and discuss. Loss of diversity, we'll be discussing. Shifts in metabolic capacity. And then finally, so-called blooms of the pathobionts. And this classification I, I kind of like because it really does give you a more, a more in-depth look at what we mean by dysbiosis. Think of a thriving ecosystem. And I don't know, some may have snorkeled or scuba dived in the past, just discharge a patient who was a scuba diver. And uh, it used to be several decades ago, you could go out and scuba dive and all oh, this colorful coral reefs and the, the fish. Unfortunately, up to 50% of our coral reefs, specifically the Great Barrier Reef, have been bleached. Been bleached. What's going on here? What was the devastating factor for such a shift in the ecosystem? What forced the little algae out of that coral, that the algae giving much of the energy to that coral plant? Well, it turns out there's probably a number of factors, but one of the main ones is global warming. Just the Several degrees increased in temperature have devastated this ecosystem. Well, let's look a little bit at genetics and specifically bacterial genetics. As you know, as you're sitting there, you have about 23 pairs. You have 23 pairs of chromosomes, one a sex pair of chromosomes, unlike a bacteria that has a single circular chromosome, but like human chromosomes, this carries the, the genetic code of life. And the genetic code is in, is in our genes, four to 5,000 genes. Unlike human cells, this bacteria can also acquire little jumping genes, as we've always referred to them as, or plasmids that can confer resistance. And there's one gene specifically as we begin to focus on how do we study who's there, what the microbiome is. And this one gene is called the 16S ribosome RNA gene. It's kind of a housekeeping gene present in every bacteria organism. And there's regions that are highly conserved and some regions that are variable. And by doing uh, gene sequencing, we can then arrive at what's called an operational taxonomic unit, an OTU, and you'll see that term thrown around in the literature. And frequently using this type of gene sequencing, we can define down to a phylum or genus level, usually not a species level. So you'll, you'll see terms of, like Firmicutes thrown around, which is a phylum, which contains organisms like Streptococcus, or sometimes even the genus name, but uncommonly a species name. So microbiome DNA analysis kind of falls into these two categories. Then you've got the 16S ribosomal sequencing, which is a quicker way of defining who is there, versus we now also have what's called whole uh, gene uh, DNA sequencing, or next generation sequencing. And as you'll see sometimes with a patient that's a mystery, we will send a specimen off, such as the University of Washington or the Mayo Clinic now, and they can do this next generation gene sequencing and look for all the, the bacteria, the viruses, fungi, and mycobacteria that could be in that specimen that we're not growing out. It turns out by using this 
non-culture form of me methodology that we have discovered in a given specimen, we may only be growing five to 10% of the bacteria that are there. So this has allowed us to have a much better uh, tool, if you will, of, of defining what is there. Well, the Human Microbiome Project from the NIH was initiated in the year 2008 to improve our understanding of the microbiota inhabiting the human body. This followed the genomic project that started in the 1990s, finished in about 2003, which was based on kind of a reductionist theory that we thought complexity was going to be equal to numbers, numbers of genes. But what the genomic study found, that we only have around 20,000 functional genes that are responsible for making proteins, the structure of life, 20,000. The mouse has 20,000. The water flea has over 30,000 genes, and weed is up to 75,000. So what's going on here? So this shifted our perspective on life. And the technology used for the genomic study then was applied to the Human Microbiome Project. And again, the culture-independent method here was the 16S ribosomal RNA method. Examined whether changes are related to health and disease. Studied 300 healthy people from 15 to 18, depending on man or woman, body sites with 12,000 samples collected over two years. That's a lot of swabs. And what the, the conclusions of that four-year project were, as they were published in 2013, that we actually are a superorganism, a human microbiota superorganism. And when initially there were estimates that we have around 100 trillion um, cells of bacteria versus only 10 trillion human cells, initially 23,000 genes, which has actually been down uh, graded to around 20,000 genes. And what we now are discovering, which we'll be reviewing, is this microbiota, the microbiome that lives with us, determines are we healthy or are we diseased? Now, since the 2013 publications, additional research and modeling and so, ha uh, so on has estimated we really have around 30 trillion human cells versus 39 trillion microbial cells. So, so somewhat more in our favor, but nevertheless, you're only 43% human if you look at the total number of your cells. Now, wait, genes are important in terms of structure and life. So Human genes, again, estimated now around 20,000, and we have 2 to 20 million microbial genes. Thus, if you look at that perspective, we're only 1% human. And if you ignore this significant microbiome population, it's hard to really maintain health optimally, as we'll be discussing. So the normal microbiome. We're going to focus on bacteria, but it, don't forget there's other things. There are archaea, fungi, viruses, the protists. The composition of a microbiota for a given individual is pretty well established by three years of life. And it's stable over a lifetime, but as we'll see, you can begin to get a weakened microbiome, losing diversity, composition, and so on. Some species are transient, like your probiotic that you take. may only be around in the intestinal tract for a few days. But each individual seems to have a unique microbial fingerprint. And as we've alluded to already, individual ecosystems are present in the human body. Now, it turns out of those 39 trillion bacteria, 38 trillion are found in the colon, along with, again, viruses, fungi, protozoa. And in general, for a given individual out of the 10,000 or so bacterial species, they're a given individual will have about 500 to 1,000 different species. Every time you have a bowel movement, 60% of the stool volume is actually bacteria. So after a bowel movement, you're actually more human. This is one of the prettiest pictures, I think, of the colon or the gut microbiome. This was done in the Sonnenberg lab and was actually submitted for a contest with Nikon and came in second. The first 
uh, place was a bee collecting pollen, or uh, collecting pollen. But what this shows is all the microbiota, and on this side, the colonocytes, and guess what this is? This is mucus, mucus. Fences make good neighbors. Mucus makes good neighbors with our microbiota. So through the microbiome project, we discovered what is there, but since then, of all those studies, and we cited thousands of studies now that have been published, they're looking at not only who is there, but what are they doing? What are they doing? How are they communicating with us? Are they sending little text messages? Or, or just what's going on? But to fast forward, we now understand that the gut or the intestinal microbiota controls our metabolism, what your weight is, if you have chronic inflammatory conditions such as type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, or the metabolic syndrome. It controls do you have autoimmune disease or not, cancer, allergies, asthma. And it also controls your behavior. Are you anxious or not? Are you depressed? How do these microbes interact with this then? Well, it turns out that in this cartoon, if you look at this microbiota layer here, the mucus here, and then you have a single layer of epithelial cells throughout the gastrointestinal tract, which is about the diameter of about half of your hair. And these cells are held together by tight junctions. And then on the, the side, the in, inner side, if you will, realizing this is the outer world here, still in the lumen of the gut. But on the inner side, we have about 70% of our immune system in the intestinal tract. That's on, it's an ongoing surveillance system. We have cells like the dendritic cell that has actually a little periscope structure that sticks into the lumen to find out who is there. The immune system is balanced then dependent on what's going on within the gut between activation or a, a type of a pro-inflammatory response, such as we see maybe with an infectious diarrhea, like with C. difficile, versus tolerance or immune suppression that over 99% of the bacteria there are, in general, are friends, as it turns out, or friendly. And in general, less than 1% are potentially pathobionts. So, our, our immune system, and especially those little dendritic cells, again, a little periscope sticking up, kind of signaling to the rest of the immune system, peace, peace, be calm and carry on. Versus danger, danger, there's a pathobiont in the region. Communication, then. how do these organisms communicate? Well, we now know that if we can feed the right microbiota with the right foods, they produce very beneficial anti-inflammatory substances and metabolites, if you will, including these uh, short-chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, that help maintain the lining of the gut. Also, we now know it gets into our system, as we'll be coming back and discussing. It signals to every organ, er actually every cell throughout our body. When the danger signal is set up to the immune system, the immune system then can communicate with the rest of the body through cytokines, chemokines, little text messages, if you will. And some of these are inflammatory, and actually some of these substances are anti-inflammatory. As it turns out, the microbiota is an unsupervised drug factory. These metabolites being released in the lumen of your gut are getting into your body. In fact, if you look at the bloodstream, it's estimated about 25% of the metabolites, the chemicals in our bloodstream, are coming from the bacteria from our gut, 25%. And we're just now beginning to slowly discover what these metabolites are doing. And, and this includes metabolites, as we'll be discussing, discussing going to the lung. Well, it turns out the Microbiome Project overlooked one important organ, the lung. 
Once upon a time, the lungs were believed to be sterile or free from bacteria. It was like a fairy tale. And when the microbiome project was initiated, that was the, the concept that we didn't need to worry about a microbiome in the lungs because we had the larynx that protected us, the upper respiratory tract, which we knew had organisms from the lower respiratory tract. And all the alveoli, all those 600 million alveoli, we thought that was a very sterile environment. But it turns out the lungs are not sterile. And the timeline we're dealing with beginning back in 1880, where it was declared the lungs were sterile. And then as the microbiome project was being completed, there were some studies that were starting to come out trickling out that suggest, well, there's bacteria down there, but it's just contamination, contamination. But beginning in 2015, there were some keystone research articles published that documented through using special techniques that indeed the lungs have a characteristic microbiome that is a healthy microbiome in healthy people, but is altered in lung disease. So let's take a closer look at what we now understand about the lung microbiome. Again, focusing on the bacteria that are there. Realizing there's also viruses, it turns out, fungi, uh, maybe proteus as well, or protozoa, but, but the viruses, fungi, are down there as well. So some of the summary statements we can now make, lungs are constantly being bombarded by microbes, even as and we have a limited audience here today uh, because of this pandemic, but those in the audience with the mask on are still breathing in organisms. The mask, of course, helps decrease your spreading larger droplets that could be infectious. It turns out the lungs are the largest host of microbial interface that we have even larger than the intestinal tract. The intestinal tract, if you open it all up, it was originally suggested it was the size of a tennis court, but that has been downsided to about half of a badminton court. The lungs, the, the, the surface area has been estimated about a third of an NBA basketball court, a third of an NBA basketball court in terms of the surface area that's there. And it turns out bacteria are coming within millimeters of our bloodstream constantly. The lung microbiome is altered in both acute and chronic disease, and lung microbiome is also altered, as we would expect, by antibiotics, steroids, proton pump inhibitors that suppress down acid production, and probably a lot of other things that we're just beginning to discover. So your lungs are full of microorganisms. Some are welcome guests, providing protection from other harmful organisms. And some are uninvited gate crashers with the potential to cause trouble if their numbers overwhelm your immune system. The lung microbiome is determined by three ecological factors, three factors. First, microbial immigration. As it turns out, and we'll come back and look at the science, but we're always constantly microaspirating, especially when we're sleeping. We inhale bacteria all the time. And then we have some direct mucosal dispersion coming from the upper respiratory tract versus microbial elimination. It's been estimated that we all cough at least about every other hour uh, to help clear up mucus. We have the mucociliary clearance, the little cilia that we had shown in the previous slide. And then we have innate and adaptive host defenses. The innate immune system is that first line of defense, such as neutrophils, uh, macrophages, and then the adaptive host defenses, where we process a portion of the enemy, so to speak, or a protein with T cells and then B cells that can make antibodies. And then we have, back to the concept of ecosystems and, and growth conditions, the nutrient availability, oxygen tension, the temperature, the pH, concentration of inflammatory cells, and so on. And so we bring that all together, and there's a spectrum then of immigration and elimination with the regional growth factors, determining, as it appears with the data we're reviewing, are you healthy or do you have advanced or more severe lung disease? So 
think about this. The air that we breathe contains around 100,000 bacteria per cubic liter, 100,000 bacteria per cubic liter, and you breathe in over 10,000 liters of air each day, 10,000 liters, which means that up to 1 billion, 1 billion bacteria can be drawn into our lungs every day. Now, the mask may be decreasing that somewhat, but again, we're always constantly breathing in these organisms. Another concept, and when I was a fellow, I was asked to write a paper on the pathogenesis in pneumonia. My mentor at the time had uh, been asked, and it was one of the uh, uh, infection prevention journals, uh, the nursing journal. And, and I went back, and this was one of the research articles that caught my eye at the time, that in 1978, and this, it turns out this concept even goes back to the 1920s, but this was one of those pivotal studies that looked at pharyngeal aspiration in normal adults and patients with depressed consciousness. And what they found that 45% of normal subjects aspirated, uh, micro-aspirated during deep sleep. Normal subjects who did not aspirate were noted to sleep poorly. 70% of the patients with depressed consciousness, those may have been they had a little too much to drink maybe uh, the night before they went to bed, uh, but up to 70% of those individuals aspirated. So aspiration of pharyngeal secretions occurs frequently in patients, especially with depressed sensorium and also in normal adults during deep sleep. This series of slides I kind of like, and you'll see the name R.P. Dixon or Bob Dixon. He is one of the main researchers in this area at the University of Michigan. And at the end, I'll come back. I kind of interacted with him concerning some of the concepts of maybe how we can utilize all this data to bring to some conclusions. But Bob Dixon and his group have done a lot of the research over the last decade. And he put together this island model of lung biogeography, high immigration rate, low immigration rate, high extinction rate versus low extinction rate. So if we focus on what are the probable positive immigration factors, what are those factors that are going to increase up the number of species present again in the lung microbiome? Well, some of these are kind of common sense, the pine positioning, the proximity to the oropharynx, uh, dependent anatomy, increased oropharyngeal microbial burden, laryngeal dysfunction, uh, gross aspiration, uh, associated with especially impaired consciousness, GERD, increased minute ventilation, and then finally certain medications are going to be in this probable positive immigration factor list. And then we have the probably negative extinction factors, those factors eliminating bacteria. So we go from high extinction rate with relatively low numbers to low extinction rate where we have been increasing microbes in our lung microbiome associated with decreased cough reflex, uh, kind of an age-associated phenomenon, endobronchial obstruction, impaired ciliary function, presence of endotracheal tube, and so on down the list down to medications. So we have a lot going on in our lung down to the alveolar structure. In fact, it's of interest that the alveoli is the only structure of the body where the immune system is outside of our body. There are macrophages within the surfactant layer, which is the thin layer of mucus-like substance within all our alveoli that has antimicrobial properties, but also it contains these little roaming macrophages that can take up a foreign antigen, like a virus, and then communicate that with our T cells and B cells. So a constant interplay, as we've reviewed, of, of immigration, elimination, along with nutrient availability. Well, it turns out, the question is, where does our lung microbiome come from? And, 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 and this has been studied extensively. And it is concluded the oral microbiome is probably the primary source of our lung microbiome, at least during health. And this, by, and this is out of the University of Michigan, another one of uh, the researchers there, Hafnagel, showed. And each of these circles consists of, as you can see here, a phylum, the Firmicutes bacteroides, often being the major phyla that we have in our microbiome. But as you can see, as they did research uh, 
that the oral microbiome here, again, predominant by bacteroidal ditties and firmicutes, was very similar to what was found in the lung. And actually, as it turns out, somewhat similar to what's going on in the stomach, but kind of disconnected from the nasal microbiome. So the conclusion, again, the oral microbiome is the primary source of our lung microbiome in health. The lung microbiome changes during disease. And just a quick summary then, ecological determinants all change dramatically in chronic lung disease. There's an altered community membership, a shift away from bacteroidetes, which is like Prevotella, Vilanella, which are our friends in general, towards what are called proteal bacteria, the Haemophilus, the Moraxella. Lung dysbiosis is associated with severity of COPD, frequency of bronchiectasis and exacerbations, mortality and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And did we get it wrong for a long time? We were giving patients with pulmonary fibrosis steroids and increased their chance of dying. And it turns out the lung microbiome is very pivotal in de determining if you survive or not from pulmonary fibrosis. Responsiveness of steroids and antibiotics and asthma is correlated with our lung microbiome. And I, I should pause as we go through this data, always think in terms of there, there's correlation and causation. And in, in some ways, we're still at a correlation level um, versus a causation. So always have to be thinking, we're still sometimes up in the solar system trying to get to Omaha. Are we going to get to Omaha and understanding all this? I think eventually. But again, always have a little healthy skepticism. But again, we'll try to present the data as it's been presented in the literature. So another concept, dysbiosis begets this inflammation, that inflammation going on within the alveoli, uh, the structure of the lung will increase mucus production, vascular permeability. You get steroids uh, thrown into the mix, and you get this inflammation and activation. And it turns out you're changing the local conditions of the ecosystem, which then changes the microbes, the microbiota that's there through increased nutrient density, increased temperature, local anoxic zones, you'll get an increased nutrient density, selective growth promotion of certain pathobionts, and then selective killing and clearance leading to a dysbiosis then, a lung or a dysbiotic lung microbiome. And a vicious cycle then is set up. Well, another concept is the gut-lung axis. As it turns out, there's this bi-directional crosstalk between the gut and lung immune systems. This is best exemplified by intestinal disturbances observed in lung diseases. And what we now understand that the gut microbiota, as we've already alluded to, through their metabolites like short-chain fatty acids, those little text messages, if you will, are being sent to all our cells and all the organs of our body, including the lungs. So, is this allowing us to maybe get a little closer to that Hippocrates was really correct in stating all disease begins in the gut? Indeed, as we now understand that this intestinal micro microbiota and through the metabolites really are determining a lot of what is going on in the lung. And if we look at health versus disease states, again, if we're back to the, the gut, a single layer of cells the little dendrite here uh, and with the lung uh, epithelium here kind of interacting. And so there are certain bacteria that are pr producing beneficial metabolites like short chain fatty acids that tend to send out signals that are anti-inflammatory versus a shift in our gut microbiome where you have a more predominant proteal bacteria, which are the gram negatives like E. coli uh, increased so-called firmicutes, which includes a whole mix of different bacteria, and decreasing bacteroidetes, which are kind of more of our friendly bacteria, you get these decreased metabolites like short-chain fatty acids and signals being sent to the lung, danger, danger.
So the emerging pathogenic links between the microbiota in the gut and lung, or the so-called gut, lung, and axis, some of the summary statements we can make include the, the gastrointestinal tract and respiratory tract, although separate organs are a part of a shared mucosal immune system termed the gut, lung, axis. The microbiota of the gut and respiratory tract are involved in the gut lung axis influencing immune responses both locally and at distant sites. Current research has identified specific bacterial taxa, their components and metabolites that can influence host immunity. And finally, we're getting closer to understanding the role of the microbiota not only in the gut but now in uh, the lung and in return respiratory diseases such as asthma. But wait, is there an an intermediate step. Is there a point where we can pass, go, and collect $200, so to speak? Well, indeed, the metabolites coming from the gut into the bloodstream, as it turns out, one recent paper here by Dang and colleagues have really documented and clarified some of the concepts behind what's going on with our immune systems. And indeed, these metabolites are also signaling to the bone marrow where there's a lot of immune activity going on and through this signaling is also producing a response in the immune system that's inflammatory or anti-inflammatory that is then signaling to the lung. Well the lung microbiome determines outcome of sepsis and ARDS so this gets us closer to understanding maybe what's going on with COVID-19 that if in some way is the lung microbiome determining an outcome with COVID-19. Let's look at the data. Well, again, we're back to Bob Dixon and his colleagues at the University of Michigan. They published this back in 2016, enrichment of the lung microbiome with gut bacteria in sepsis and ARDS. Well, in this paper, they reviewed this concept, the importance of gut microbiome in the pathogenesis as a critical illness has been well established for 60 years. That data is back there. And as we know, suppression of gut bacteria, such as through enteric antibiotics, uh, and in, in animal uh, models, uh, have really associated or correlated the gut microbiota with uh, sepsis and ARDS. And dozens of clinical trials have demonstrated that the suppression of the gut microbiome, there's this concept, and. I reviewed this years ago when I did this paper for the pathogenesis of pneumonia that we knew selective decontamination of the digestive tract with oral antibiotics was a protective factor against multi-organ failure and dying of critical illness. Now this has caught on in Europe, especially countries like Netherlands. The problem, this concept has really never caught on in this country because there's a the individuals out there, th this is just going to select out for resistance, and, and there's a lot of factors there with drug resistance. But again, this concept out there, boy, if we can suppress down the microbiome of the gut, which probably is suppressing down more the pathobionts, but that less than 1%, we can improve outcome from critical disease. Also, the concept of permeability of the intestinal wall is increased in critical illness and predictive of clinical outcome. This concept, I hate the term leaky gut, but that's what we're talking about here. A leaky gut, the, the tight junctions of the epithelium in the intestinal tract opens up, opens up, and allows the hordes in, so to speak, that then the immune system is responding to. And allowing, as we'll discuss, translocation of bacteria that appears from the gut to organs such as the lung. Well, this study, again in 2016, was the first culture-independent analysis. We're going back to the same methodology, that 16S ribosomal RNA, the methodology, non-culture-based, realizing we were, if we took these specimens, like, and this was through bronchoscopy and BALs and so on with special techniques, we could only culture about 5% of the organisms in that specimen versus we're now picking up another 95% of who's there. The study showed disorder of the lung microbiome characterized by enrichment with proteal bacterium phylum, again, the Haemophilus moraxella, and gets us into enterics uh, as well enriched in the lung microbiota of patients with inflammatory lung conditions, and by contrast, decreased alveolar concentrations 
um, of so-called inflammatory markers like tumor necrosis factor were associated with our friendly bacteria, but like Bacteroidetes, the Prevotella bilinella, uh, which were found in healthy individuals. So the findings suggested a mechanism of immigration or a type of a translocation of the gut microbiota to the lung, which was at least correlated with injury. A year later, they came back with another paper and kind of summarized all this uh, these concepts that selected the contamination digestive tract is protective against multi-organ failure, uh, the idea of leaky gut leading to multi-organ dis dysfunction syndrome, on um, the culture identified translocation of gut bacteria also was found and historically has been found with surgical patients that go in and culture the lymph nodes and they find these gut bacteria. We, so we know that bacteria are getting out of the gut, especially when it's leaky into our lymph system. In fact, it's estimated that every 24 hours you're filtering two liters, two liters of lymph fluid through your lungs coming from your gut. That it, filters into the lymphatic system and the thoracic duct into the, uh, the venous side of the bloodstream into the lungs. So it's hypothesized that may be another way of translocating bacteria into the lung. So this whole concept of leaky gut, you go back and look at, actually we've known this for years now, and this was a paper in 1998 that under normal conditions, the intestinal epithelium barrier acts as a selective route of entry, allowing movement of necessary molecules through the epithelium. That in general, when we eat a food, we break it down, we digest it, ideally to the basic building blocks of glucose or uh, fructose, galactose, amino acids, uh, the fatty acids, and those, there's a mechanism of getting that through the cell. Um, but when you've got this so-called leaky gut, this allows things to get through a disruption of that barrier, and thus we're getting across poorly digested foods, we're getting pathobiome centering in, and, and so on. So this can all lead to an inflammatory response, as they're summarizing again in this paper, that an abnormal intestinal permeability has been identified as a marker of clinical disease in a number of chronic and acute inflammatory intestinal disorders. And in conclusion, GI dysfunction may be a stimulus for development of multi-organ dysfunction syndrome. And this again was published way back in 1998. Again, this concept of leaky gut, I, I kind of hate that term. I, there's a, a lot of hype out there. I mean, if you look at this on the web, I mean, people are attributing everything, all symptoms <laughs> to a leaky gut. As it turns out, we all may have some degree of this, but again, the concept, again, tight junction and then compromise. And in fact, Alessio Fasano, uh, about 20 years ago, he's a pediatric gastroenterologist at Mass General now at Children's Hospital there. He discovered a hormone called zonulin, zonulin, that is responsible. It's the only substance found so far. Zonulin opens up these tight junctions. So increased intestinal permeability is associated with dysbiosis and what happens in critically ill patients, the question is what's really going on here? Well, we know with critically ill patients, you have a disruption, sometimes of anatomy, but more so maybe function, the physiology. Those are three major areas of study when it comes to the gastrointestinal tract. But when you alter motility, you then alter the distribution of organisms. You also frequently are giving them proton pump inhibitors, so you're decreasing acid, which is a very important uh, barrier to bacteria getting uh, through the, the stomach and bile salt production drops, IgA production drops, and all this has a net effect on reducing the elimination of bacteria that normally should primarily be down in our colon. And there's a so-called creep phenomenon, and what we see then slowly bacteria and potentially Canada are creeping up into the stomach, and then potentially we're refluxing this up into our oral pharyngeal area is what's hypothesized. So we go from very low numbers to relatively high numbers of what's called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or small intestinal fungal overgrowth. Now this was another a paper I'd reviewed years ago which caught my eye. The altered ecosystem of the critically ill patient, if you look at the proportion of oropharyngeal cultures containing gram-negative rods 
E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, Pseudomonas, and so on. In healthy volunteers, the, in general, we didn't find these gram negatives in our oral pharyngeal area. But as we got patients staying in the hospital, and this was also true in patients who were in extended care facilities, there was a progressive increase in finding so-called gram negatives in our oral pharynx, such as E. coli and Klebsiella. So to summarize then, what we reviewed is, is the data behind how the gut microbiome is interacting with our lung microbiome, including not only sending out text messages like short chain fatty acids and affecting the immune system, but also it appears that we're actually sending bacteria from our gut to our lung. And these are the mechanisms, and it may be a combination of these mechanisms via aspiration of oral pharyngeal microbiota when we become more colonized with these organisms that are pathobionts when we're more critically ill or bed bound. Or it appears, and Bob Dixon and his colleagues believe that there's translocation from the gut associated with the increased intestinal permeability or so-called leaky gut via the bloodstream or as we uh, mentioned via the lymphatic system. Or could we have organisms just in our lung microbiome that otherwise are not detectable, but then they bloom out when the local ecosystem conditions are changed. So, they're proposing we're at a point where we should maybe broaden our concept of ARDS, what's going on with COVID-19 in terms of the pathogenesis. We traditionally looked at A, exposure to hosts, but now do we need to include the lung microbiome in our understanding of the pathogenesis of ARDS? And there's three potential hypotheses. One, exposure lung microbiome uh, may e mediate lung injury or exposure and hosts and then lung injury alters the lung microbiome or are we with this hypothesis dysbiosis and lung injury perpetuate e each other in a non-resolving ARDS. Well it turns out everything is everywhere but the environment selects. Turns out the alteration of bacteria ecology and the injured alveoli, if you think about it, bacterial growth interacts with nutrient abundance. And when we have increased intravelular edema, we have increased protein, and we're changing the very conditions that promote the growth of these pathobionts and leading to local injury then, and then inflammation. And it becomes a vicious cycle then of bacterial growth local inflammation, injury to the epithelium, uh, more edema, and more uh, uh, protein to pr provide growth of, again, these pathobionts. It also turns out, it's an, this is an interesting observation, that catecholamines are steroids, cortisol, and the study, again, by Dixon and his colleagues, if you looked at uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa growth here, control versus norepinephrine and dopamine, and as the lung community became more dominated, uh, as they looked at the concentration of catecholamines in alveolar fluid, so the presence of increasing corticosteroids or catecholamines increased the growth of specific bacteria, Pseudomonas. So finally, we come up with the last research article that came out of the University of Michigan, and that was just earlier in this year. It turns out that our lung microbiota predicts outcomes in critically ill and mechanically ventilated patients. This was a paper published again by Bob Dixon and his colleagues, and what they looked at and concluded was that key features of the lung microbiome, the bacterial burden and enrichment with gut-associated bacteria predict outcomes in critically ill patients. So here in this slide, they were looking at the lung microbiota and mechanically ventilated critically ill patients, the density of bacteria or the burden. And so the percent of patients extubated and alive correlated with a low bacterial burden. And normally the lung microbiome in healthy people, even though it has quite a bit of diversity reflecting the oral microbiome is at least a hundredfold less than the, the mouth. But what they found in patients who were more critically ill, there was an increasing density of bacteria. 
In addition, they found a change in bacterial diversity. If you maintained the higher diversity but lower burden, you had a better outcome versus those that had a poorer outcome with lower diversity tend to begin, the, the, or at least the alveolar fluid became predominated by Enterobacter aceae, or the, the gram negatives, including E. coli, and a, a group of uh, a family called Lactospiraceae that both are derived and associated with the gut microbiome. So, in conclusion, what this study added to what we now understand about the lung microbiome among mechanically ventilated, critically ill patients, variation in the lung microbiota at admission predicts outcome from critical care. And there, there were two key features, again, that they looked at well, of the lung microbiome, again, bronch, uh, alveolar uh, fluid, and these two key features that predicted ventilator-free days, the bacterial burden, and the community composition. The correlation between gut-associated bacteria and ARDS validates prior findings that they had published and supports the hypothesis that translocation of gut bacteria in, to the lungs contributes to the pathogenesis of lung injuries, such as we see with COVID-19.